The Dark Wheel by Robert Holmstock. They had been set up, of course, and away they went into the setup gamely. Alex checked up on the planet Sirag and discovered that it was not listed with the official planetary register. That was the reason for its unfamiliar name. Not to be registered was not in itself unusual. Only inhabited worlds were listed. There were millions of inhabited star systems of use to miners, and traders and explorers, which could only be located by reference to the galactic gazetteer of worlds. But Sirac was inhabited by intelligent beings. That meant just one thing. Sirac was an independent world, had refused Federation status, was dangerous, probably deadly, most likely the haven for freebooters and criminals, and almost certainly a system in which the general principle of laser first, talk second was applied. We've got to be crazy, Alicia said. Alex agreed. Could Sirag be Raxler? Could it be the world my father mentioned before he died? No way. Sirag is Sirag, and Raxler, if it exists, is in another galaxy. You know the legends. Sirag is just a hellhole of a world by the sound of it. Give the guy his turtles back. Let's trade life bones. But Alex said no. Something about the whole deal, about the way he felt manipulated, guided, had wet his appetite for this adventure. It was good money to be made, and the nemesis could finally equip itself to perfection. And the hunt could begin. Vengeance could begin. It's hit or miss, right? And in Raph's eloquent language, we will not know a god about any failure. We've got to be crazy, Alicia repeated. Let's not talk to any strangers, at least. Out of which space? The planet Sirag floated before them, a pastel yellow world, the dark markings upon its surface, mountains probably, or deserts, forming a pattern that reminded Alex of bones. At 19 light years from Caesar, the Nemesis made two refuelling stops, and as they came into system space they had energy enough for two light year jump only. The nearest world, Alex knew, was more than twice that distance away. No matter, with their new fuel scoop, they would simply transit the sun's corona and recharge the fuel cells. Sirag's sun was a large yellow star, old but with much life left in it. It was active too, as Alicia, at the astrogation controls, turned towards it. So two immense streamers of fire were erupting from its surface, whirlpools of plasma that were spectacular when seen through the Nemesis's polarising filters. Let's catch some of that heat, Alicia said, and punch for top speed. The nemesis surged forwards, but they flew for no more than a minute. Holy mother of the stars! Alex stared at the scanner screens and felt his stomach turn over. The bright marks there were so large that they could only be Boa or Anaconda-class cruisers. They'd formed an attack pattern. Four large ships surrounded by the darting points of light that was its fighter escort. On the view screen, against the glowing sun, the assault group were dark smears rapidly closing. Boas, Alicia said. They're set up as fighter cruisers by the looks of it. At least they're slow. Hang on. Alex gripped his seat, then grimaced as he fell for the same trap that his father had always set for him. But this time, it was as well that he'd secured himself. The universe shifted, his body organs did somersaults. Alicia feigned an escape loop and the fighters, mambas by the looks of them, broke formation and went into the scatter mode that meant pursuit. But Alicia completed the loop to come back against the looming pirate craft. She sailed under the belly of the leader with as much calm and cheek as you please. It belly shot at them and she rolled the cobra so that she could side strafe back all along the boa's underbelly. Shards and sparks flew brightly where the shields were lowered around the laser housings. 
Markings are unfamiliar, Alex said. There'd been black and green flags with bright sunbursts on them and non-terrestrial ideographs on the sides. Intentions very familiar, Alicia breathed. Behind them, two of the mambas were closing fast. Pulses of laser fire made eerie streaks in the dark circle of space around the glowing sun ahead of them. The huge ships had turned too and were accelerating towards them. Alicia made it clear, without speaking, that they'd never reach the star and have time to refuel. Alex, never taking his eyes from the scanners, knew as much. Alicia rolled the cobra and turned to fight. She targeted a missile and dispatched it on the turn and the nearest fighter became a glittering dust cloud. The other streaked fire across the forward shields and the nemesis shuddered and whined. Two stabs of her finger on the side fire button and the second mamba tumbled. Its shield still up, his pilot disorientated by the unexpected hit. Alicia closed in for the kill. Killed. One of the bowers loomed large from the darkness. It was rolling slowly and beams of light played from its spike nose. Alicia targeted a missile. Sweat ran freely from her face and her hands were white with tension. Alex, feeling helpless, gripped the sides of his chair, leaning forward, jumping and starting in sympathy with every movement, every avoiding action. The bower ECM'd the missile before it had gone a tenth of the distance between the two ships. The nemesis slid smoothly along its belly and, and again turned side on, strafing the sensitive underparts as it matched the giant's slow roll. And then it happened. From somewhere, out of nowhere, pulsing laser fire made a direct aft hit on them. The nemesis shuddered and stuttered and was forced into a rapid, dizzying roll, Alex swore, feeling his body wrenched by the seat harness. The shock had nearly taken his head off. He straightened up, assessing the situation, but there were two mambas behind and they were closing rapidly on the moor of an anaconda. It hovered there, in the void, like a giant net waiting to swallow them. Let's see you get out of this, Alex said loudly and glanced at Alicia to see why she was running so straight. She was slumped in her chair. Blood flowed freely from her scalp and nose. Her eyes were closed. She must have had a seatbelt too loosely fastened and struck the console when the cobra had bucked. Alex leapt from his co-pilot's seat and literally wrenched the woman free, throwing her to the floor. There was no time for courtesy. He buckled in, stabbed fire at the anaconda's ram scoop, then overflew dodging laser and outrunning a missile, which then closed on him with alarming speed before he was able to destroy it. The planet Sirag was ahead of them once more. He began to run for safety. Then I thought, an alarming thought. What guarantees did he have that the Coriolis network would protect him if he got in range? He had no such guarantee. The space stations were as likely to be against him as the ships that pursued him. But if he could let them know what he carried... If he could communicate that he carried their god creatures, perhaps they would send their fighters to keep the freebooters at bay. To his right, a mamba appeared out of nowhere. He rolled the nemesis and shot from his rear laser and then slowed speed, span and strafed the killer vessel from his port gun, watching the mamba tumble out of control, not destroyed, just dead. If only he could release the cargo, jettison the canisters containing the Mimerth life systems. Perhaps the pursuit would end. He and Alicia would be out of pocket by 300 credits, but... So what? Neither he nor Alicia were elite, yet. He might feel like an elite combatier, but faced with this sort of... A mamba strafed him, shield screamed, he targeted a missile but used side fire to battle with the attacker. Faced with this sort of pressure, neither of them could survive. Alicia came round, staggered to her feet and stared through blood-encrusted eyes at the combat. Sirag came closer, a tiny spinning point of silver light winked and beckoned to them, but the sight of it did not fill Alex with joy. There must be more than my mirth in those canisters, Alicia said quietly. Let's discuss it later, Alex retorted, as he rolled and veered to escape the fire coming from the closest of the big ships. The woman left the bridge. Hanging on for dear life, she went down to the cargo bay, and suddenly, the attack finished. Alex nearly jumped with surprise. One moment, his tail had been hot and his port laser almost at the exploding point. The next, nothing. The heavy lights of the massive pirate ships dropped away into the background, Two of the Mambas continued to dog his tail for a moment, firing last 
optimistic bursts of fire. Then they vanished, streaking away into darkness, away from the sun. Alex slowed the nemesis and checked damage levels. They were not seriously hurt, but two missiles were gone and energy levels were low. The cargo was intact, however, and the pirates had backed off this close to the world. It could only mean that Sirag would defend its visitors. Elysia came back onto the bridge, holding the small black box that was the Thruvis camera. They look like turtles. They stink like turtles. They're boring as turtles. But I've taken a few Thruvi shots just to see if anything else is hiding in there. And good idea. Let's see. Two or three minutes. She placed the camera down, sat back in the co-pilot's seat and looked at him. You OK? Alex nodded, shaken. How about you? Bruised, bloody, but unbowed. We in the safe zone? Mm, looks that way. The Coriolis station span gently before them, bright with sunlight, casting its shadow on the patchy grey and yellow of the huge world below. Several ships were tethered to buoys close by. They looked safe enough. Lights flashed on the station. Everything gleamed, everything welcomed. Alex sailed gracefully past the immense flying city, then turned to face the entrance. But there was no entrance. What in God's... He sat there, motionless, in space, rotation matched with the Coriolis, facing blank metal. By zooming in, he could see the shape of the entrance, closed now, protectively. Afraid of strangers? Alicia suggested. We need fuel badly. They'd better not be too afraid. Then, the crackle of an audio message coming in. On the screen, only the space station, with stars and the sun beyond. Identify. Identify. This is Sirag Orbit Space. Cobra class trader, the nemesis, Alex said. We have a cargo of Mimoth. Open the gates. There was a silence for a while, though the channel remained open because it continued to hiss and crackle. Then, attention, nemesis, Mimoth trade in Coriolis stations is prohibited. What? Is prohibited. Release your cargo before coming aboard. Release cargo, you will be compensated. Alex glanced at Alicia. What the hell do we do? Sounds unprofessional to me, the woman said. Sounds a little fishy. She picked up the camera and removed the developed and printed film. Staring at the two prints for a moment, she suddenly seemed to realise what she was looking at and gasped. Oh, my sweet world, she said slowly and passed the prints to Alex. On the screen, the entrance to the space station began to open slowly. Two lights shone there, like eyes, tiny in the dark void space beyond. Alex looked at the Thruvi pictures and for a second couldn't comprehend the grotesque sights he saw. Looking through the bodies of the Mime Earth, the camera had picked up the spider-like life forms that were living inside the shuffling, harmless turtle forms. The sight was discomforting. Jointed legs seemed to be reaching out into every limb and every body space. The central black body was shiny, and from it peered a number of bloated, faceted eyes. Two long, bristly tendrils stretched into the Mimoth's brains from each of these hideous parasites. What are they? Alex whispered. And Alicia said, Trouble. They're immature Thargoids. Alex felt his heart quicken. Tharglets! He was transporting Tharglets, the larval forms of one of the most deadly life forms in the known galaxy. Set up? Being set up hardly began to describe the way they'd been duped on Caesar. No wonder the pirates had closed so ravenously. There's good bounty on Tharglets. The Navy pay well for research purposes. They're also deadly, and they make ideal mercenary fighters if trained and developed. We've been carrying fighters for Sirag. Pirate fighters. No wonder they want to destroy us. They won't want any evidence left of this. Alex stared at the space station. For a moment, Elysia's words just went in. 
and didn't register. He was thinking of the pirates who had attacked and who had been beaten back. He was thinking that the danger was over. They were at a Coriolis station, and the only danger now was illegal trading. He was thinking safety. He watched as the bright eyes slid forward out of the spaceport. Behind the eyes came the bulky shape of the ship to which they were attached. Behind the ship came light, bright light, a gleaming yellow beam that cast the shadow of the ship across the nemesis. The shadow of a snake, the cobra. He would have known that ship anywhere. It was months since he'd seen it, but not a night had passed when the shape of it, when the evil of it had not infested his dreams. The ship that had destroyed the Avalonia came slowly towards him, and he had no doubt at all as to its identity. And nor had Alicia. She sucked in her teeth and moved towards the console. I want him. Let me take the controls. Sit down, Alex said coldly, and Alicia turned angrily on him. I have as much stake in this as you. Look at the draw. Alex said, the pilot of that ship killed my father, killed my whole family. We're escaping from Tiorge. We asked that ship for help, for supplies, took my sister and myself as slaves. Blasted my family's vessel to peace. I escaped. My sister didn't, Alex. My sister didn't. Alex, I want that bastard. Too late. Fire blossomed from the front of the Cobra. The nemesis rocked and rattled. Alex targeted a missile, then stabbed the laser fire back. The energy spread over the cobra screens like a bright yellow flower. It accelerated towards them. Alex accelerated too, but rose over the killer and over the space station. We can't fight it. We've not got the weapons, nor the defences. Not yet. Damn, what should we do? On the rear screen, Alex saw the sombre shape of the killer rising above the Coriolis station. A flash of light presaged the warning incoming missile, and Alex targeted the ECM to destroy it. As he did so, he turned. The two ships tore past each other, majestic metal galleons, raking each other with fire before turning and approaching again. Twice they dueled in this way. The nemesis groaned beneath the weight of the laser strikes on its hull. The energy in its storage cells began to drain away. In Alex's mind, there was only confusion. The Cobra knew him and wanted him and wouldn't let go. And this was the ship he wanted to kill. But... He wasn't equipped to kill it. Not yet. Not yet. So despite Alicia's objections, Alex turned and ran for the sun. The Cobra followed. The two ships manoeuvred and looped, slowed and speeded up whenever possible. Alex rear-lasered, and this had the effect of driving the pirate back a little. It targeted and dispatched three more missiles, and Alex shot them down. He was tempted to think that represented the full missile load of the Cobra, but he wisely avoided such complacency. His own missile remained targeted, ready to fly, but he imagined that it would meet a quick and pointless fate. The sun edged closer. It grew in size and majesty. The cabin temperature of the nemesis rose. Immense arms of plasma curled out from the surface like weird creatures rising above a molten sea. Alex flew towards one, fuel scoop ready. The cobra fired at him. Shields screeched. The duelling ships entered the realm of the inf Burno. Alex said, it's working. Look, the fuel gauge was edging up as the scoop sucked in raw plasma and converted it to the energy form needed for which space transit. He skimmed the nemesis along the edge of the great ocean of fire. The arms of the corona was millions of miles long, thousands wide, and curling round like a whirlpool. At its centre, then, there was a calm place, a place away from the heat and danger. Alex headed towards it. The cabin filled with an eerie brilliance in which shadows seemed to writhe and beckon. The sun was an unbearable glare. The temperature of the ship rose dramatically. Fire played about the hull. The shields moaned and creaked. Not long, Alicia said. At last, she too had come to realise that they were just not ready to fight the Cobra. They had to get out of here. And fast, the nearest star was six light years distant. Their fuel gauge showed a jump capability of four and rising. In the calm sea, wrapped around by sunfire, the nemesis hovered and waited. Somewhere in the brilliant glow of the plasma arm, the cobra searched for them, but perhaps they were safe now, safe from scanning or from probing, since no electronic eye could pierce the intense radiation field of the corona. 
Five light years and climbing. Get ready to go. We're already targeted. I'm ready, Alex said. He tried not to think of the consequences of such a long, unsupervised jump. In the first instance, they would just jump small distances, but the hyperdrive mechanism wouldn't tolerate too many such feeble movements. Alex turned the nemesis so it gently span in a circle, searching the flickering, shadowy fire for danger. 5.5 light years. A minute more. Just 60 seconds. Just 30 seconds. We're filling up lovely. The ship hummed. Alex dripped with sweat. Just 20 seconds more, Alex, and we can fly like starseed. On the scanners, the merest flicker of light hinted at the presence of the cobra. It was on the other side of the strand of plasma. A curtain of fire separated them. Nemesis and Killer stood motionless in space, facing each other through the great erupting wave of sunfire. We're ready to go, Alicia said. Alex, go now! Alex Ryder shrugged her off. No, he said. Not yet. Alex! He pushed the ship towards the fire. The flickering, ghostly image on the scanners moved too, closing. And with a sudden cry, Alex stabbed speed into the nemesis's engines and raced towards the veil of flame and plasma. All vision had gone. All he could see was his father's face, the white ball of flame that had been the Avalonia. All he could feel was grief and anger and hate. All he knew was that he had a missile targeted on the Cobra and that he had one last desperate chance. The ships closed. The distance between them was the distance of the plasma veil. It played on the hull of the nemesis, and the shield screamed and complained. He could not go too deep, not too far in, too dangerous. He fired the missile. The tiny vessel sped into the sunfire, weaving and ducking as it homed on the cobra. It didn't show on Alex's scanner. It didn't show on the cobra's scanner. Not until it was too late. The Cobra triggered its ECM. Alex saw the burst of brightness, the sudden detonation, and then he saw the great fireball that gyrated around the destroyed missile. Momentum, heat, plasma, fire, all gathered together into a ball of death that swept from the corona and engulfed the Cobra. No shield known could stand against such intense energy. The raw energy of the sun, stung and screaming, blown into a great tidal wave of explosive terror. The cobra was bathed in light and fire. Alex watched the scanner and suddenly the light was gone. The cobra was dead. Destroyed. Gone forever. The nemesis slowed and turned and went back to safety. No one on the bridge said a word. But in the bright light of the ageing sun, tears glistened on two faces. The hollow fac of Raf Zeta gleamed and shimmered on the bridge of the Nemesis, as if with pride. Behind it, the full face of Lave was a welcome and relaxing sight. The last of the Mimoth and their precious parasites had been offloaded into two Navy ASP-type ships. The final payment had not yet been agreed, but the figure would not be less than 100 credits per creature. I knew you could do it, Raf said, chewing happily and stroking his wispy side whiskers. Had to be sure, but was confident enough to get you to Sirag before you were ready. We could have been killed. Alex muttered. That system was crawling with... But a good combateer, even an elite combateer, knows when to run and how to run. I'm proud of you. You ran and scored. And as he spoke, so on the screen a message came through from the Galactic Police HQ on Lave Coriolis 6. Congratulations to Alex Ryder and thanks on behalf of the Galactic Cooperative of Worlds for your efforts and skill in destroying pirate vessels as documented by you and verified by onboard V-Film. We have pleasure in assigning to you the combat status of Deadly. Your legal status of Offender has been negated. Your new rating as Deadly will be lodged in the GAL network within a standard day. Select wisely in battle and be strong. So there it was. Alex was not yet 20 Earth years of age and had come within one step of being rated more highly as a combateer than most people would even dream about. He was deadly. He'd killed the Cobra. 
Why the Cobra had killed his father, Alex hadn't thought to ask. Of the ship's pilot, at least. He'd guessed that the ship and its bounty killer pilot had simply been earning a wage. Instead, he said to Raf, Did you know the ship was at Sarag? Had a good idea of it, Alex. That's why we sent the Tharglets with you. Nobody, if they're a tad evil, can resist booty like that. I knew it would bring every freebooter for a light year after you, but I reckoned you could handle them. Most importantly, I was damn sure that your cargo would bring out the Cobra. You fought well. You showed the sort of instinct for combat that I remember in Jason. He was right. You are the man to follow him. Follow him where? Raf chuckled and shook his head. You see, that's the big question. Your father was chasing the mythical planet Raxler. Does it exist? Or does it not? If it does, then... On Raxler, there's an alien construct that's a gateway to other universes. And all that's in those universes, in way of bounty, and treasures, and aliens, and life. Jason Ryder was convinced that Raxler existed. That's why he trained for and became a part of the Dark Wheel, the Legend Seekers. I hadn't heard much from him, or about him, for some time, till just before he died when he told me he had found evidence for the real existence of Raxler. He came back from deep space to get a proper team together. Raff smiled bitterly. Just before he was about to go back, he decided to take a safe world holiday jaunt with his son. And an assassin was waiting for him. But why? Alex asked. Why kill him for finding Raxler? Because there are people on Raxler already. This is only a guess, mind you, but from what happened to Jason, I'd say it was close to being right. We've long suspected that the core of elites live there, or exploiting the gateway. They're powerful, twisted men, powerful enough to hire an assassin to kill the threat to their dominance. Raf leaned a little closer to Alex, his bright eyes gleaming, an intense look on his grizzled face. I put you through your paces, Alex. You and Alicia both. The Dark Wheel needs you. Both of you. But believe me, what you've just been through is nothing to what you face now. You've got to become elite, Alex. And that means a lot of training. And a lot of fighting. Maybe a lot of months. Even years. But then the universe will open up before you in a way you never imagined possible. Alex stood silent, thoughtful, watching the old man. In the corner, half in shadows, Alicia stood and watched too, frightened by what she was hearing. Has the grief gone? Raph asked, and Alex nodded. The old trader smiled. How does it feel to be rich? Empty, Alex said. Raph Zetta laughed. You'll do for the dark wheel, Alex. You'll do.